so the last class we're going to talk about, and it's not really a class, actually it's not even connected with the classes we've been talking about, but it is. And this is having to do with a, uh, probably, if I were to ask people, could you name a parable, they might come up with this one as one of the first ones, and that's the, the parable of the sower. And can I just say that I'm pretty certain that for the majority of my life, I, uh, I read this parable, and I completely did not get the message. I just did not get the message. Um, I hope I have it now. I'd like to share with you some, uh, some thoughts about this chapter. Um, I used to think of this as um, a parable that helped us to understand groups of people. That there was this sower, and this, first of all, it was a, it's a very odd sower, isn't it? Uh, you know, anybody who is in farming here would say, who would sow good seed on hard pan soil? on the wayside, on the, on the roadside. Who would do that? And where there's rocks and where there's known thorns that are going to come up. Who would do that? You, you know, you take your good seed and you put it into the best soil possible with the idea that it's all going to come up and it's going to come up really well and it's going to be fruitful for you. Well, furthermore, so that was one of the first things I thought is that, you know, there's a lesson here about if we think about preaching the truth that is very important. And I think this is a valuable lesson, even though I don't think that's the core lesson that's being taught by the Lord Jesus here. And that is that um, the sowing of the seed by us should involve no discrimination. That we should preach the word everywhere in places where we don't think it'll take as well as places that we do. And I, I always find this to be, uh, as I have said before, uh, incredible. We do a very, very poor job of identifying who we think is going to accept the Word of God. Uh, oftentimes it's the person sitting in the back that's not saying anything that is the one that you actually don't even expect they're going to respond, and they're the ones that do. And how many times has it been true that people in places and in situations and in phases of life where we would not expect that that person would have interest in the truth has in fact responded. So one of the first lessons could be that our preaching of the truth needs to be to all men and women, all who would hear, um, and not to select areas that we would focus on and areas we wouldn't focus on but to uh, broadly do this. I, I think one of the really interesting things has been uh, learned to uh, the, um, excuse me, this is your Bible.com, which is uh, going to the World Wide Web and saying to anybody who's out there that's interested, uh, you could read about the Bible. Um, I can tell you, the, the first few people who actually um, learned the truth and were baptized are remarkable stories. I just have to share this quick one. Uh, the first person, uh, the first person was uh, actually in a part of Africa, and he was involved with being a witch doctor. Seriously, and was beginning to look at the Bible and to spend more time interested in that, but he couldn't find what he was considering to good, good teaching, and he was connected with brethren in that area and was baptized. Well, I sure never thought that that's where, uh, when we put together in North America, this is your Bible.com, that that's where it was going to go. Um, and I could go on for other stories. The, the number of people, they don't always happen to be convenient places, but the word, when it's just indiscriminately shared, can land in places that we would never expect. So that's kind of an important lesson, but I don't think that's the core lesson. Did you notice how many times the Lord says, I think it's close to a half dozen times that he says, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Did you notice that? So when he says that, what I'm thinking is that we need to be stopping and listening and thinking about what he's saying. In other words, this is a lesson for me, not just a category of people. Well, here's what I used to think. 
I used to think that this was always talking about the way groups of people respond to the truth. There are some people that are like, uh, they're on the, like the seed that fell on the wayside. You know, it just, you preach the truth and it goes nowhere. In one ear and out the other. Just goes nowhere. Those, those are the people who are on the wayside. And then there were those who, uh, who were on stony ground. And those are, those are the ones who, they heard the word and they were pleased about it, but they just didn't have enough depth of, soul, uh, of soil. And because of it, their response to the truth is immediate, but it dies off very quickly because it doesn't have substance. And then a third group, which is that which fell among thorns. And these are ones that came into the truth and because they allowed the, the thorns and the cares of this life to choke them, they lost their interest in the truth and eventually were wilted and, and died away. And then finally there was the good ground. And that's us, right? We're, we're the good ground, right? We're the ones that uh, we're still here. We're the ones that are committed to serving. And so I used to think that, that was really what was the intention here. It was for us to think in terms of how the word, you could look at different people and different examples and say, oh, that was a person who was among thorns, allowed the world to get in and choke them. What I'd like to suggest to you is uh, that may not be the main teaching that the Lord had for us. <clears throat> so let's just go back and think about these different conditions, first of all. First, there was, the, uh, there was the seed that fell on the wayside, and the ground was impenetrable. The seed landed on it, and, but there was no porosity. It couldn't sink in. It couldn't penetrate. Now, when I was a kid, we used to um, walk to school. You know, by the way, I know this will be a shock to some of the kids today, but we used to walk to school. <laughs> My parents used to walk to school in the snow, but we walked, we walked to school. And uh, it was pretty close to a mile that we had to walk. And I remember there was one place that we could walk through uh, where you kind of cut through next to a wash. And that was great because, you know, as a boy, you had to throw rocks in the wash. Uh, but they had this path that was really beaten down. And around it were, you know, plants and so forth. But this one pathway was hard pan ground. And I remember that one time we came through after it rained and it was almost like it was dry. All the water that had hit this path just kind of beat it off and, and went to areas where it would be absorbed elsewhere. Um, because there was nothing that came up in this pathway. It was completely uh, imporous. Well, what was happening, you see, is that in this case, the seed is falling on it, and what's happening is that people were hearing, but, it's, but Jesus says the adversary comes and removes it, or the fowls of the ears devour it. So what's happening in this case is seed is landing on this really rocky soil, or, or I should say like dead, uh, uh, it could be like, a, I guess you could say like a roadside. You would never expect it would grow there, and it doesn't. It doesn't penetrate. It goes nowhere and eventually is, is taken away. So that's the first one. The second one, of course, is stony ground, and that's different because you actually get germination, don't you? What happens is with this stony ground, there's, there's not much soil, but there's enough for that plant to spring up, but it never really gets its roots down. And because of that, what happens is people hear and they receive the word with gladness, the Lord says, but the roots never thrive, and under the burden of heat, uh, the heat of the day, it cannot sustain itself, and it withers. Uh, as he says in verse 17, the affliction and persecution that arises for the word's sake causes it to wilt away. So, stony ground. So the first one was, the seed goes nowhere. The second one is, it goes in... And it starts to germinate, but it doesn't really even become a full plant before it, uh, it perishes. Now, the third one is quite interesting, and that is where the seed falls in among the thorns. And what happens there is the, is the plant actually takes root, and it grows, and it manages to survive the heat. So it's got roots, and it's, it's surviving. But eventually, what happens is the thorns 
choke it. The thorns that come up afterwards, they, the, the seeds were there, and the, and the thorns come up afterwards and they choke the plant. It doesn't kill the plant, but what it does is the plant never has the opportunity to bear fruit. So you have a plant that looks like it should be able to bear fruit, but it's not bearing fruit. And it says, Jesus says that what happens in these cases are the cares and the deceitfulness of riches and the lust that choke, they choke the word and the plant is unfruitful. So you get a really great looking plant, but it never produces fruit. And notice that the thorns grow up afterwards, after the germination and the growth. So it starts off looking like a pretty good plant and it actually looks pretty good most of the way through, but it just never produces fruit. Okay? And fourth is the good ground. And that is where the plant roots. It not only roots, it's, it grows, it survives the heat, and it bears fruit. And not only does it bear fruit, but some bears 30-fold, some 60, and some 100-fold. So that's kind of the background of this parable. Jesus is talking about four conditions that I've always in the past thought, well, that's kind of uh, describing how people respond to the gospel. You know, some people, it goes nowhere. Some people, it doesn't really root. Some people, it roots, but it doesn't really seem to produce the fruit of the Spirit. And then the, fa the last one, which of course is that which is uh, all about the good ground, where it flourishes and brings forth uh, uh, the, the fruit of the Spirit. The more I started thinking about this, and I kept remembering that Jesus is saying, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear, and reminding us over and over that we need to hear this, the more I began to realize that all four of those conditions exist in my heart. So let's talk about that for a moment. It's a, it's a difficult message. There are times in my life where the message of truth is impenetrable. There are times when I hear, but there just doesn't seem to be a place in my life for that word at that time. Now I'd like to think that doesn't happen very often, and I'd like to think that that has been changed in my life, but we can within our own hearts have times where there's just no place for the word to penetrate. You know, I may understand the exhortation from the word, but it sits on the surface and it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I've seen this happen with others too, and not just myself. Um, I've oftentimes heard exhortations uh, re pleading for people to participate more or to be at meeting more frequently or whatever, you know, to, to read or study our Bibles more, and yet behavior doesn't seem to change. It's like there is this uh, lack of porosity, and the, and the word doesn't really penetrate. And that can be a condition in my heart and I have to be really watchful for that. <clears throat> well, what about stony ground? You know, it's interesting in Ezekiel, um, it talks about how uh, God was going to give Israel a new heart and take away the stony heart um, out of their flesh. And the stony heart is whenever I receive the message, but there's not the firm, ongoing commitment. Um, it sounds like a compelling idea. Uh, I might be excited to get started, but then life kind of happens. And eventually I begin to wilt from my commitment. Whatever that habit might be, whether it's to, uh, to do more Bible reading, or to go home and to commit myself to a stronger prayer life, uh, to, uh, to preach the truth, whatever it might be, when the truth gets difficult in these cases, it says that uh, when we're persecuted for it, there's no root and it withers away. And so one of the areas I have to watch out for in my heart is where I, the word does penetrate, but it doesn't really germinate. It doesn't really take hold. I know I need to love my brother, but I don't take the steps to show my love and to forgive. 
Well, then there's the third. There's the third one, which is the idea of thorns. And this is the time, this is the time whenever I, I make the choice to live the right way, but what I try to do is live with one foot in and one foot out, as we've said earlier this week, um, where I allow myself to be corrupted by the things of the, of the world. Um, you know, there's a great example of this with Solomon. You know, it, one of the saddest things for me is, is the story of Solomon. I'm sure it is for you too. Uh, I, I can't think of anybody who was wiser other than the Lord Jesus Christ in Scripture than Solomon. And yet Solomon, in his life, what he did is systematically he created opportunities for him to fail. He started, maybe not the first time, but one of the major things was creating the league with Pharaoh and marrying Pharaoh's daughter. And then taking on more and more wives to the point where with his wives and concubines he gets to a thousand. But then he recognizes that it's not right for, his, for the daughter of Pharaoh to dwell in his house. And so what he does is he, he builds a house for her and all harem for the rest of his wives that are right next door. Now just, I want you to think about that really for a second. What is he fundamentally doing? What he's fundamentally doing is he's saying, I know that there's some things that are wrong about some of these alliances I've made uh, with people from, that are from Canaanite areas, from, uh, from Egypt, etc. And rather than correcting the problem or stopping the problem from growing, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put little walls around them. I'm going to put these little walls around them so that I can kind of isolate them. They can kind of be conveniently by in my life, but I'm not going to deal with the problem. I'm going to put, I'm going to put walls around it. That's what Solomon does, and it absolutely is his ruin by the end of his life. Now, I don't know about you, but sometimes there are places in my heart where I can put walls around little secret areas that I protect. Instead of dealing with those issues, we can have in the dark recesses of our hearts places that we protect, that we keep kind of hands off. And in those particular cases, what happens is what we can do is indeed uh, find that we don't bear fruit. If you would, keep your hand here in Mark and turn with me over to uh, 1 Peter chapter 2. 1 Peter chapter 2. And we'll start um, at verse 9 for connection. And this is again talking about whenever we are like the the ground in the, the heart that our heart can be like the ground that has thorns in it. And it says this in verse nine: "Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but." are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Verse 11, dearly beloved, I beseech you. Now, by the way, I just don't think the King James use of that word probably really gets the point. Beseech is pleading with you. I am imploring you, please. I'm imploring you as strangers and pilgrims, Abstain from fleshly lusts. All right, well, we've heard that before, right? That we should abstain from fleshly lusts. But why does he say we should abstain from fleshly lusts? Which war against the soul. So what is it that's happening whenever I allow sin and fleshly lust into my life? When I harbor those kinds of things, what happens is I have released an army against my mind. I have allowed for the corruption of my mind. I brought it in by, in, it's, it's the idea uh, the, where it says war against the soul is, the Greek word is strateo, which is the idea of a battle, an array that's being unleashed. 
So what is the point here? Though well, the point is, is that whenever we have hearts that are encumbered by the things of the flesh, when we trust in the deceitfulness of, wit, of riches, when we are involved in the, uh, uh, the things of the flesh, the, uh, the lust of the flesh, what we are doing is releasing, as it were, a virus in our minds. What we're doing is actually causing it so that our minds are no longer able to produce the fruit of the Spirit, but indeed are a place where that cannot flourish. So what happens? We can kind of look like a full-grown plant. We can look pretty good. We can be at meeting. We can be uh, to everybody looking like things are going well. But the problem is we're not bearing the fruit of the Spirit. It's not a natural thing that's exuding from us. And so instead of something where maybe you feel like if I do a good work, if I can just make that happen, that we're, that's the way we need to live our lives. Actually, the way we're supposed to live our lives is that the fruit of the Spirit is a natural thing that comes forward out of us. But we cannot do this when we do like Solomon did, which is to allow for sin to be in our lives. We can't allow ourselves to have thorns that are encumbering our ground. And of course, the last part that makes up our hearts is the good ground. And this is when we listen to the word and we're open. We reflect and the mind begins to transform. It goes from thinking like the flesh to thinking like the spirit. And when it does this, the more progressively that we're able to think like the mind of the spirit, the more natural our religion becomes. The more natural it is to love our brother. The more natural it is for us to abstain from fleshly lusts. That is the peace that is offered to us through scriptures. You know, the idea of the good ground is one that is it's, it's so attractive to us. We're told in Isaiah 61 that we will be trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. That's the good soil. And if we go over to James, look over at James, uh, the third chapter. Verse 16. You see, this is where we're finding in verse 16 where there is thorns that are in our lives and are keeping us from the true peace we're expected to have. For where envy and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. But, verse 17... The wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. So brothers and sisters, if we want to truly have peace in our life, we can't be involved in the cares and weighted down by the things of the world. That's deceitfulness. What we need to do is to abstain from those things, to take root so that in our lives we can be without hypocrisy. And then the fruit of righteousness sown in us in peace can then be seen. So the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And so, brothers and sisters, as we remember the Lord here, you know, just a few moments, we see the perfect ground, don't we? Uh, in him, we see that he was able to generate in his life, naturally, the fruit of the Spirit. In all of his ways, we see the reflection of his Father. And so the prayer we have for each one of us in this room is to open our hearts to the word, not to reserve hard panned paths or walled off recesses in our hearts, but to open completely before our Lord and to come before our high priest with boldness and to ask his help. 
and we desire more than an appearance of a faithful and well-developed plant, what we want to develop in our lives is a plant that bears fruit. And why can we do this? And why can we do this with, with confidence? Well, we'll close with Hebrews chapter 4, a passage very familiar to all of us. It's because as much as we may know our own selves and think we know our own selves, where we think we have impenetrable hearts, where we think we may have uh, problems with stoniness or thorns, the one who knows us best is our Lord, the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And so, brothers and sisters, as we remember our Lord, let's ask for his help. Let's come to him and ask boldly for help in removing the hard pan and the rocks and the thorns in our lives so that we might live unto him without hypocrisy, serving him and producing some 30-fold, some 60, and some 100.